intro, uh, Steffi. Yeah, so welcome everybody to the Imaging One World um, Monday just afternoon lecture series. We have today um, a speaker from Delft, Professor Bernd Rieger. He's um, studied physics and worked in Tom Jobin's lab in Göttingen. He always worked, I think, on image processing and analysis. And recently, or what he's showing us is the work on super resolution, also in connection, I think, with linking light and electron microscopy to gain um, even greater resolution than what well, we all kind of are kind of expecting. So we're hoping to see some very interesting and um, challenging discussions as well. They already started because Kirti, one of our colleagues, and already we have kind of started already discussions on MinFlex data, which I think will be of interest to many. And I think I, I haven't really probably introduced you very ex comprehensively, but maybe you should just start your talk without me kind of trying to make sense of, <laughs> of your talk because before I've seen it. So please, Bernd, um, introduce yourself a little bit more and more importantly, start your lecture and tell us about your work. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. I will just uh, first share my screen and tell a bit. Yes, thank you. Myself. Oh, so you have about um, 35 minutes, 40 minutes, and then we have the um, Mentimeter quiz, which has been prepared by Nick today. And hopefully then we have some discussion and general reflections on what you present. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so I have the, oh no, oh no, this chat box is, in the middle of my screen, I have to change that. Bit. Okay, better. Um, yeah, so my name is Bernd Rieger. I work uh, in Delft, in the Netherlands. So here in the background, you see a picture of uh, Vermeer, which is a Dutch painter. And he painted Delft at that time, how it should look like. So this is how he would envision it to look like. Nowadays, it's uh, unfortunately not much prettier. So if you come to see the university, you can still see parts of that, like the, the old churches and the canals, and the nice things. But the university buildings, of course, are not so nice. Um, so I have a long uh, history, mainly on, let's say, more the image processing or data-driven uh, application to microscopy. Well, uh, not, so, not so much the optics, but what can you do with the microscope and how can you change it a bit or what can you do with the data that comes out from that. And it has also put me in the, in the idea of uh, data fusion or particle averaging. Okay. So for the day, I made a small uh, overview. These are the things I wanted to discuss with. And the first, I will start a bit of with the resolution in super resolution single molecule localization based microscopy. And then uh, take it from there, what are the different uh, aspects that you should go through that. So this is just a rough guideline. And the lecture is also recorded. So, you can watch that. Um, so I want you to question you a bit. So I assume you're familiar with the single, single molecule localization microscopy. And probably you know that this is a localization precision, this uncertainty of determining where is the fluorescent emitter, scales as the wavelength divided by the square root of the number of detected photons. So in principle, this resolution is infinite. Eh? If you can acquire an infinite number of photons, this might be also infinitely sharp. And this is what you would expect from this formula, or if you make the wavelength very small. Now the question is, is this really the case? Now, if you think about this for a bit, in particular, if you think now, um, you probably have heard of the, the term min flux. This was introduced 
a few years ago by the lab of Stefan Hell. And they do not localize the molecule by one uh, wide field illumination, but they use a, a series of pattern illumination. And with they, this, they can change this localization precision to be scaling with the length of how far they move this uh, pattern. Now, because you can make this moving of this pattern as small as you want, then in principle now, you come towards something that's an infinite resolution very quickly, or at least a resolution that's on the order of the size of a molecule. Now, if this is the case, and you would also expect that the resolution is very nice. Okay, so the, in, the first introduction of this min flux that only would work, let's say, for one emitter. There have been a few other uh, approaches also by us uh, where you could use this idea to do this over a large field of view. On the other hand, you did not get this uh, very nice improvement that they have. So, nevertheless, so I took a, a picture from uh, one of these min flux publications. Now to highlight a bit of a point that this localization precision is very important, but it's not everything that you would like to have as a user looking at the image and understand biology from that. Okay. So from an, uh, let's say an engineering point of view, you can say, okay, the microscope is fine and because it detects every molecule, the fluorescent molecule that's in the image, that's nice, but if the labeling density is not also high, you might not see the stuff that you want to see. Okay. Now, um, if you have a look at this uh, picture, that's from um, one of the publications from the MinFlux. On the top, you see uh, the nuclear pore. You hear the nuclear pore in 69 stained in three different images. And what you expect is sort of a, an eight, eightfold rotational symmetric blob-like structure. This is how the, the fluorophores should be arranged. So now you see this sort of, but you might not see it as good as you think when you have a look, such a high localization precision. So why is that? Now that's typically because stuff is also missing. Now, for example, if you look here, there's no molecule detected. Now that might be because there's just nothing bound. So this makes a problem that this labeling procedure, which is a biochemical process that statistically that dot did not work. Now, okay, if it did not work, you cannot detect it, or maybe your method is not so sensitive. So that's a, yeah, so this has a problem in the apparent information that's captured in the image. So this particle averaging is about how can we get rid of this apparent under labeling? If for some reason biochemically you cannot improve this anymore because you already have done the best as possible, what can you do then by computational methods? Okay, and from here, I want to talk, think a bit about imagine that this labeling density, so this missing part, or maybe here there's some part is scattered. So it's not as nice as you would like. So, what you typically do, you try to acquire more instances of the same data and then look at the combined image. If you think why that should work. So the idea would be to increase the resolution. With the resolution, I mean the useful image content, but you were doing more acquisitions. So that's something that's very common. If you think the signal to noise ratio is poor, reacquire the data and then you average that. And if you look at the definition of the peak signal to noise ratio, so that's the logarithm of the maximum intensity divided by the standard deviation of the noise. Now, if you acquire multiple data of the same sample, and then the standard deviation of the multiple gets smaller by a factor of square root of n. Now, if you fill this in into this uh, formula here on the top, you find for the peak signal to noise ratio that it is the signal to noise ratio of one acquisition plus this factor. So that means you get an 
increase in the signal to noise ratio that scales as the logarithm of the number of acquisitions. Okay, that firstly means and this is the important part here. If you get 10 times more images, you get 10 dB better signal to noise ratio. But for another 10 dB, you already need 100 times. So that means acquiring more and more data in the end has diminishing returns. Okay, so that seems to be a good strategy to get rid of noise. Now, that's of course a very old idea, um, but you also, if you have used the confocal microscope, you have this, done this many times, and that's by using a line averaging. So here on the left, you see an image that's acquired in a short, very short time. And if you now do line averaging, you get the same image, but nicer. So why is that? That's because the noise average out and the signal gets coherently enhanced. So that's a very old trick. Um, and that's also has been done in the electron microscopy world since, I don't know, 40 years at least. And there they call this trick single particle analysis. And so here on the left side, you see an electron microscopy image and it's negatively stained. And here, the signal to noise ratio is so poor that you nearly do not see where is the interesting stuff compared to, let's say, the noise. On the other hand, now if you do this very nicely and you have and this molecule is imaged in a projection. So you, they're looking through um, a certain uh, component. Uh, this is here, you see this cup. Then they take the projection. Then you take all these projections, you align them nicely, and then you combine them. Then you can get a very nice overall image. So this works already for a very long time. That's not. Okay, that's nice. So the idea that they, <clears throat> that they follow is that you have to image chemically identical macromolecules. Okay, so this trick of course works if the stuff is really exactly the same. Then you have all these different pictures. You have to make them that they are aligned, which is called the registration process because otherwise this averaging does not work. So this info, uh, the signal is added up, but the noise cancels out. And then in the end, get one single reconstruction with a very high signal to noise ratio. And that is very successful in electron microscopy. So here I've shown a graph from how many particles you can combine against what is the resolution. Um, it was taken from this publication below. Now, what's important is that these how this resolution scales with the number of uh, particles, this really scales as the square root of n. That's exactly how you would expect it from uh, um, the combining of the data. So that means people are very, very much interested in putting more and more particles together because then the data becomes better. So at that time they used uh, on the order of 100,000 particles often, but you can, uh, also go to 1 million. So you can see that this really more particles is better, okay? One thing that you see here on this side is the question, how is resolution defined in electron microscopy? And why does this become better when you add more particles? Right? If you think about the diffraction limit, then there's nothing about particles. It's only about wavelength. So why is that? And that's because this resolution measure that they use that's called Fourier ring correlation or Fourier shell correlation that takes into account correlation. Okay, that means also the density of the data, not only the precision. Let's have a look. Now, so what I've shown you here is some points, okay, that you cannot make out a lot. Now we're going to increase this by adding more data to that. So what do you see? Now, 
Now, with a bit of imagination, you can see the diffraction limit formula coming up. Right, so here, lambda divided by 2n sine of alpha. So why is that? That's just because we added more data. So in terms of localization microscopy, we increased the labeling density, but we did do nothing with the localization precision. And the way to assess this improvement in the useful resolution, that is done um, by something that's called Fourier ring correlation in uh, light microscopy. You can also use that. So you have a data set, you split it in two independent data sets, and then you compute the correlation as a function of one of the length scale. Now, if you look not so closely, then these two images look very much alike. So it's this high correlation. And if you look very closely, they don't look very much alike. So there's a transition between these two regimes and there you have to take a threshold and take a resolution now luckily in electron microscopy they have worked on this for many years so from let's say in the 80s uh, so with these three papers a number of uh, prominent people have sorted out how to do that and this is also adapted for light microscopy so then uh, you compute this correlation threshold and then you just threshold it at a certain value. Typically, that's uh, one over seven. And then you can find a resolution. This is what you can also do with the super resolution. And that apparently also includes the density of the labels, not only how well it's localized. That's nice. Okay. Now, how can we apply this to light microscopy? Um, so first of all, you have to make sure that this, to understand that this averaging, this only increases the signal to noise ratio. That does do nothing for the like, localization precision. Uh, so this will not get better. In electron microscopy, that's also works very nice eh, because they are not limited by diffraction, but they're limited by the dose on the biomolecule. Um, light mass cross B, of course, now is also not diffraction limited anymore. So this matches, this idea is then applicable. And then you have to think in electron microscopy, of course, they fix everything. So everything that they have an image is always fixed. That's, of course, not the case with light microscopy. But in super resolution microscopy, that typically is the case. So the application should work out also for light microscopy. Now, the downside is, of course, that the image formation, so how the what you see on the camera for light and electron microscopy is very different. Okay, so I've written up here a long list of things. It's not the same. So in electron microscopy, most of all, you acquire a pixelated data. And so you get a sensor that's fully filled with information. The camera, also, but in localization microscopy, you just get a list of coordinates. That means also the information content in EM is much higher, also because this is the size of the camera and not just a list of coordinates. In EM, each molecule is really the same. There's no problem with not labeling certain sites and the molecules looking different. In localization microscopy, you might have one fluorophore that's located five times an image, the other one 10 times, or only one time. So there's a lot of problems that these images that you might think they should be the same, they're not the same. So even if the algorithm is perfect. Now, if your algorithm to detect these single molecule events generates a bit of false positives, you again have a problem. The resolution, if you do 3D imaging, is not the same. So there's a quite a number of differences that you have to think about. Now, that also limits the usefulness of the code that's available from the cryo-electron microscopy world so as long as the images that you acquire in light microscopy are very nice, very good label, 
then you can pixelate them and use the algorithms from EM. So some groups have done that. That then really works nicely and you can make use of all these 30 man years of brain power that went into this software. Sometimes it does not work, then you have to take a different approach. Okay. So here I took a short history in, let's say, when new methods were presented for particle averaging in light microscopy. There's, of course, a lot of bias to stuff that we have done. So they start in, we did this for the first time in 2012. Um, and then I will talk you a bit through the developments uh, over the last 10 years. Um, so there are also some other groups like Ricardo Enriquez or Salas or from uh, Susania Mendy. So most of them, they have uh, adapted existing electromicroscopy software and use this um, on light microscopy data. So that works depending on your data, but it might also fail. So we'll talk a bit through that uh, idea and how what we have done uh, at the moment. Okay. So here's the, I try to visualize the idea of this particle fusion. Imagine you have a structure, here's the nuclear pore complex again, where you see a number of uh, different fluorophores line up. Now what you can do with this fusion, if you would bring them all together because you have a lot of missing labeling sites, this data fusion solves the under labeling problem. Now that's very nice because this is really a way to increase the useful information content from the image. Of course, this assumes that the underlying structure is exactly the same. Come back to that later. So what did we do in this uh, in 2012? So here we started in, uh, here you see the nuclear pore um, acquired. Uh, so this is not a human nuclear pore, but from a frog. Um, but still, so you see, here's a, an app. Here you see a bit of a, a zoomed in version. Uh, so you see about an eight fold symmetric site, but it's not so super clear. Okay. Then we thought maybe we can combine the information of all of them and average that. And on the right, you see how that looks like if you have done that. Now, this is a lot crisper and nicer than we have done before. And now please look at the numbers. So we only used a few hundred of that and not hundreds of thousands like in the EM. That's because of the information density that's so much less in light microscopy than in EM. And because you only see in principle these eight locations with the fluorophore. And so in a perfect world, you should only see eight dots and that's it if the eight binding sites. Now, you see a very nice thing. Now that works because you have many identical copies and you increase the signal to noise ratio. Okay, that's nice. Now, here I just have zoomed in this a bit. And here you see the original data in the background. Here you see one pore and then here you see the average. Now, please note that I've written that this distance here has an answer is 164 nanometers plus minus 0.5. Okay. So this is 0.5 nanometers. That's very small. Eh? That's smaller than um, a fluorophore. So why can this be so unbelievable high precision? This diameter of the of this nuclear pore complex. And that's because we did the measurement after we did the averaging. So you can imagine that because we increased the signal to noise ratio by averaging all this data, the noise goes out. And here I show a radial histogram. So this is the, the radius. And here you see the number of localizations. So if you project this 
and you see that this peak here, that's very smooth. Now the question is how well can you estimate this peak now? Now this goes with a very high precision. Uh, that's only based on the width of this and the number of localizations. So this goes very, very precisely. So also with light microscopy, you can now do very precise measurements, for example, of the distance or the size because of this averaging trick. So that's very nice. Here also show an overlay with electron microscopy, uh, but that's fake. So that's not really a correlative microscopy. I just have to move this image over an, a negative stain EM just to make it look pretty. Okay. So the downside was there was at that time this was only possible because we have forced each data acquisition onto a model of the nuclear pore with an eightfold symmetry. So we assumed that the pore was a ring with eight binding sites. Now, of course, this is a very strong prior knowledge. Now, the question is, do you get out what you put in? Um, so at that time, this was, of course, the first. And so it was nice to get something out. But of course, that was a problem. So this is typically something you want to avoid that you put in a very strong model um, to do this registration. Otherwise, you could be very much biased. And to be honest, this also happened in the electron microscopy community for a very long time. They had a lot of biases in their estimation. Now that's solved, luckily. Then we went on a few years later. We did the same thing now for 3D. So here we acquired the nuclear pole in 3D. So here you see a top projection of a reconstructed pore and a side projection. So please note that the let's say the Z resolution is much worse than the X and Y. And also here already, uh, you should see typically you would expect that there would be two. Uh, Chlorophores, one in the cytoplasmic and one in the nuclear envelope of the of the nucleus, uh, but that that was not resolved at that time. Also, at that time, the measurement was really nice. So for that, we used also a template registration, which is not so nice, but it was three D and it was the best we could do. And the math here looks relatively complicated, but that's because we want to make sure that we can handle, first of all, the anisotropic localization precision. We can handle the problem with the missing labels. So that's one of the largest problem. Imagine you have, so this is one image and this is another image. So in one image, my thumb is missing. And now you want to, with a computer, align these two. This will not work because it will not match it up like this, but it would, would do is like this. If you use a typical least squares approach. So you have to come up with a different way to do this matching. And this uh, Bhattacharya distance function that did exactly that. So we started with that with a model and that worked out nicely. Okay. Then again, a few years later, we started to move away from a template. So we said, okay, we do not know what the data looks like and we still want to do this averaging trick. And that's where you really want to go. So we started off in 2D and also on DNA origami, which is not so nice. So here you see there's a design in DNA origami of the TU Delft logo. It's always good to use something from your employer um, they like this and then they want to keep you, okay? Then here in the middle, you see one acquisition of this uh, TU Delft logo by, super, by paint super resolution. Uh, you already see a bit the T, here you see a U and the D, and here's a sort of a flame, but it's very poor, poorly visible. So here you see a few of these now, but they're not so 
nicely visible. Now, if you combine all of them, you get something like this. Now the resolution, or at least what you can see, is a lot better. And these different dots that you can see now, they are the binding sites on the DNA and origami. So the distance between two sides, that's five nanometer. So you can distinguish something that was never ever possible here. And that was done without a template. And so we did not enforce this TLDL of logo on the, on the data, but we thought, ah, we just assume everything is the same. And so here I have the same images again, but a bit larger, just to show you the, the power of this averaging. If you compare this to this data here, it's a lot nicer. And so then you can also directly see what is the benefit from that. Okay, let's move on. So here's a bit of the idea that we used at that time because this registration of this noisy data, that's very difficult. So what did we do in the beginning? We assumed, okay, let's imagine you have four of these particles and you want to match them the best you can do. Now, how can we do that without knowing what the data looks like? So we thought, okay, we just try everything on everything. And that's what's called this all to all registration. We have a look how well the blue matches to the yellow, the blue to the red and the blue to the green. But we also have a look how the, well the red matches to this one and the green to this one. So you see for four particles, that's very easy. But if you, if you have a large number, this becomes very, very difficult. Um, the advantage is that this, all these measurements, they're very redundant as you have a lot of extra information because everything should be self-consistent. So we thought about how can we enforce the self-consistency on all these different uh, transformations that are encoded in this matrix here. So we found a way to do that. And that worked out nice. So that means at the end, we came up with one nice uh, average, one reconstruction. And this we then later could use as a data tra template, uh, template and then register everything to that. This gave this nice result. Okay. So this was this idea. We also computed the resolution on that and that indeed is a bit better than this five nanometer yeah. what you see here in the distance between the two. Uh, five. Okay. The downside is, as I said before, it's very difficult in terms of computation if you have a large number of particles and the computation speed could be one hour, uh, one day on a, um, on a small cluster with GPU acceleration. So that's not so nice. Just keep this in mind if we then would like to go to 3D. Um, because a few years later, we thought, okay, we should, the nuclear pore is not 2D, but it's 3D. So we tried this. So here you see, let's say one particle, right? that's one nuclear pore. There are not so many localizations, but if you combine hundreds of them, now you can see this. Now you clearly see this eightfold symmetry and you see the distance between nuclear and the cytoplasmic side that's uh, about 50 nanometers or 60 and so you can really nicely resolve this in uh, in light microscopy uh, that's very nice so it's the same idea but now in 3d so here you see a number of particles once you have that done you can of course make a lot of measurements on that uh, for example, you can measure the distance between the two rings. You can measure how large is one ring. And, so, and these, these measurements, again, they will be very precise because you have, you could even show that this top and the bottom ring, they don't lie exactly on top of each other, but they're ju just a bit shifted out of phase that you see on this side. Okay, let's see in terms of time, I have to maybe skip a few things. 
Uh, maybe I want to show this nice animation. And so this would, if you take the data and render it a bit nicer and then visualize. So we skip the, we skip the symmetry part. Yeah. And the, that's the last thing I want to show. Uh, so yet, this year we have come up with an idea to make this registration a bit faster, in particular if you have more particles. Uh, and that's based on an uh, algorithm from IEEE PAMI that uses, uh, let's say, Gaussian mixture models that, to try to fit to the data. And that works relatively okay, but this model gets really easy stuck in a local minima. Huh? So it does not converge to the global solution. And it depends on the initialization of these Gaussians. Um, so how did we solve this then? So we just did this many times. Um, and this many times, we use this then, uh, we had a lot of different outputs and we used a different paper that we had before on classifying different classes. Then based on this, we found a way how we could connect or uh, find the different um, different approaches to go to one result. Now, if you look at that, so this algorithm that we show here, if you have a look at this picture F here, this gives the reconstruction from this uh, TU Delft logo in a very poor condition with 30% density of labeling. And if you compare this to the old performance that I just showed you before, it is all to all method. It's quite a bit nicer and the computation time, this can be run on a CPU uh, within a few minutes where this typically would take hours on a GPU. Now, we also did this for really a lot of particles. So you know, if we go now to the thousands or tens of thousands, uh, we can do this uh, on a, let's say on a very decent CPU in, uh, in hours instead of that it would take days. Eh? Because remember with the other method, the computational time uh, went with the, with the power of the particles into the second. Uh, so it's, uh, it's not, does not scale too nicely. Okay. So now we apply this also to the newest 3D nuclear pore data. Um, so here I show you the only the reconstructions where we had a few thousand particles. So here you see a side view and a top view of the nuclear and the cytoplasmic ring. This was done without assuming that the data is eightfold symmetric. And so that's a important point. We did not enforce this on the data. Now, if you look a bit closely at these blobs here, they look a bit elongated. And what you also see that the, let's say the tilt of this ellipse is not the same for the nuclear or for the cytoplasmic ring. Now, if you sort this out a bit better, then it turns out they're even anti-parallel. Okay, so that's, that means that this elliptic shape cannot be an artifact of the data averaging. So this must be really something from the data, this sort of ellipticity per blob. And then we started thinking, what could that be? Of course, the electromicroscopy model predicts that there should be two fluorophores inside this uh, porin 69. Okay, so if you have two fluorophores, this should uh, produce an elongated uh, distribution. That's also exactly what you observe. So then we measured the ellipticity of each of these uh, blobs and we measured the angle. And it's very consistent. So this angle is always on the order of, let's say, 17 degrees plus or 17 degrees minus, depending if you're on the upper or the lower ring. So this means there is 
really indication for a dimer structure in the data. Uh, that's very nice. And the distance between these dimers and the EM model is it's only on the order of 10 nanometer. And that could not, and that still cannot really be resolved. So they can see it, but there's a strong indication of that. And in the end, we compare this with the electron microscopy model. Um, so this is uh, available electron density map, and we can put in the center of mass of this. You can make a prediction where the snap tag, uh, where the data is aligned should be, and then you can uh, put in the data that that we find. So that now brings us to the idea that uh, this particle fusion in live microscopy that could assist also uh, cryo EM. Uh, to some okay and with that uh, i want to conclude so in summary i would say that this a template free approach for particle averaging 2 or in 3d works even if there's high unlabeling and if it's not needed to use a symmetry approach this high underlabeling uh, that is the key that we really can resolve with the the particle averaging. The software uh, that is out there from electron microscopy and that was adapted also by other, uh, by other groups that really is feasible if the data has is good quality and good quality means many localizations and good labeling. If you start to explore something like this, also be aware that there's no need for 100,000 uh, particles or more like an electron microscopy, but let's say 100 to 1,000 is really sufficient because the information density is so much lower. Now the outlook, where should we go? Uh, I think one of the hardest issues is that we should deal with structural variations because we assume everything is exactly the same. But that might not be true. So the nuclear pores, they might not be all eight-fold symmetric, but they could be nine-fold or seven-fold symmetric, maybe depending on the development cycle. But still, if we average them in and we just assume everything is the same, then the dominant class will be also visible. So, that would be something we have to figure out and that you'd only do this averaging per class. Um, and you would like to be able to deal with, the, let's say, the less photons or the less localizations you, re you acquire. Also, the data itself will be more unsimilar, even if the underlying structure is exactly the same. So how can we do this in an algorithmic fashion? And then, of course, you want to combine it with cryo-EM because cryo-EM gives very good uh, structural detail, but this gives you very good specificity. So that really, I think we should combine it with that. And yeah, with that, I put in uh, some names and pictures of people that uh, worked with me over the years at these uh, problems. With that, I want uh, to thank you for your attention. Right, thank you very much for that, uh, for that talk, Bernd. Um, so now we traditionally go into the Mentimeter quiz, which I've already put the link up. It's in the chat. You want to have a look and click on that. You should go into the um, into the Mentimeter quiz. Um, Bernd, if you could un, un uh, share your screen, then I'll put the um, I can put the landing page up for that one. Oh, we've got a few people in there already, by the look of it. Yep, the secret to better single molecule localization microscopy. <laughs> T. <laughs> I definitely get <laughs> tea. Well, maybe water in your case, then. Um, well, we got we got six participants. If anybody else wants to sign up, good looks and great software. It's, NA. NA is always a good thing to have. Um, more photons. <laughs> They're always good to have as well. Um, 
and we've got seven people in there filtering. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, um, while we're doing, running the quiz, feel free to stick your questions in the chat as well, and we'll get to those afterwards. Um, let's just wait another second or two, see if anybody else wants to join. Uh, anybody else coming in? Right. I think well, in that case, oh yeah, here we go. We've got eight people in there. Right, let's, let's start the quiz. So, question one. Um, I have to say, the uh, answers are short and uh, short and sweet today, so there's a chance to get really quick on the on the uh, button. So really do answer as quickly as possible, and you get a chance to win the uh, fold scope. So here we are. Answer fast to get more points. Here. So what is not an advantage provided by particle averaging in fluorescence microscopy? Is it increased localization precision, increased signal to noise ratio, or filtering of underlabeling? This is not an advantage. There we go. Oh yes, people really were paying attention. It is localization precision because that is, I guess, a property of each fluorescent uh, blinking molecule. Okay. Oy. Well, we were supposed to get the um, we were supposed to get the uh, leaderboard. Let's see what happens after question two then. I hope it does go straight into the uh, leaderboard because you can see who's actually getting there. Are cryo-EM particle averaging algorithms directly applicable to single molecule localization microscopy data? Yes, no, or depends on uh, labeling. And we definitely had the answer to this question. So let's see what people, let's see what people listen. Depends on labeling of the data. So if your uh, sample is well labeled, it can work. Ah, we go. Uh, we did get a leaderboard. Leaderboard, right? So, Dan, you are in the lead. Mary, hot on your tail. Frosty, Booyah, and Barefoot Contessa, La La Lem, and Stingalicious. All uh, all got a chance to catch up. All right, so again, fast answers will get you more points. All right, here we go. Question three. With more and more particles, the resolution of a single molecule localization microscopy particle reconstruction also increases. Yes, yes, but only up to a point or no. And again, this, this topic was discussed. Uh, the answer is yes, but only up to a point. So let's see where that puts the leaderboard now. Oh. Booyah. Oh, yeah, we might well have got a change in. Uh, booyah, you are back in, you were in the lead. Okay. So there's a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of closer competition now. We've got five people in contention. Right. So let's see what happens now. So this is question four. Two more questions to go. Um, feature measurements on a reconstructed particle is more precise than on, on all the single particles individually. Yes, no, or does not matter. And the answer is... Yes. Okay. So let's see where that puts us on the leaderboard. Oh, it's, ooh, ooh. I think we've got to change again. Oh, <laughs> it's going, oh, it's all over the place. Dan is back in the lead again. Mr. Micro and Mary are still there. All right. So I think uh, it's going to be on this last question. Mm -hmm. 
Is an isotropic resolution of 3D imaging by, for example, a cylindrical lens can be mitigated by particle averaging. Yes, no, or depends on the posed distribution of the particles. And the answer is no, so you're sort of stuck with it. Okay, let's see, see what the leaderboard says. Oh. <laughs> oh, Dan, you made it just is a six, three, three. You made it by four points, Dan. Well done. Um, if you could send your um, contact details to the RMS or stick it in the side, one of the chaps, something like that. We'll send you a fold scope. Um, in the meantime, do we have any questions? No one's got any questions in here. Let me just check the. Um... Well, actually, in that case, Ben, um, if anybody wants to stick up their hand and ask a question, please feel free to do so. I should be able to see you. But. Um, I've actually got a couple of questions. So this was fairly early on. I mean, overcounting was a sort of early concern in single molecule localization microscopy. Is that um, you know, let's say a molecule either reappears sometime later in the in the acquisition, or or just yeah, just gets looked at twice or three times. Is, is that a particular concern anymore, or does that not particularly affect the this sort of these averaging? Um, approaches you're talking about you know so of course let's say over undercounting at least the, the number of localizations per molecule is not constant that of course makes typically a problem if you want to measure similarity between particles right um so that makes it problematic to the to design a, a measure that works on that, so in particular for cross correlation, which is used in the EM uh, softwares. This is really an issue. Right. So, I mean, you can imagine in a typical electromicrograph, they all have the same dose, but now if they're dose variations because of this overall undercounting, you're yeah. stuck with that. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful to just to design the metric for that. Um, that is a, that is a problem, uh, but you can work around that uh, if you change that a bit. Right. Um, <clears throat> does anyone want to put their hand up or ask a question? I'm still looking in the chat, see what we've got here. Questions? Okay, they're very. Uh, everyone's very shy today. So actually, I would last. This is really speaks to your perspective slide. Um, I mean, are, are we ready to move away from the nuclear poor? in terms of these methods? Um, yeah, so let's say for a light microscopy, that's a nice size, but for electron microscopy, it's a very large complex. And so they would typically look at a lot smaller structures like a virus or maybe a ribosome. Um, so for them, it's not so easy, but for, the, for light microscopy, uh, so the, the downside is, I would say, because of electron microscopy, this, uh, this complex is rel relatively well established in terms of structure. So the question is, can you learn something new? That might be the case um, if we are able to solve the biological variation dilemma. And there's a paper from the group of yeah. Martin Beck that also the, the, the diameter of the nuclear pores, they really change depending how you treat the cells. And this is a, really a lot by what they change. I mean, 10 nanometer or more. So this should be feasible to look in a light microscopy. I think because we can come away with a lot less numbers to have a good image. Um, here, the strength would come into play to, the, uh, to go a bit in, into that direction. All right. 
Okay, thanks. I can see that, Curti, you've got your hand raised. So I'll hand over to you, Curti. Do you want to ask your question directly? Yeah, yeah. So, so we uh, uh, continuing uh, on our with our discussion. I, I missed most of your talk. Like I had another meeting, but so so let's say like um, uh, we have like uh, different uh, you know uh, core models like seven component and seven subunits, eight subunit, nine subunits. So how important uh, does the particle averaging becomes when you want to determine the let's say three D distances between inner and uh, outer layer of the pores or yeah or cytoplasmic layers the uh, so I think if you if you have a, a in the averaging part to determine the z distance, this yeah. will make no yeah. impact at all. Um, because even if you have less pores per, let's say per ring, they still will be aligned, let's say in one plane. Um, so I cannot see that, let's say that this goes like this. If the pores are still in one plane. So I would not expect that this to happen. So you might be mis have misalignment in the plane, but that the distance becomes worse. I'm not so. I don't think that. Uh, so for the radius, for the radius, everything can go wrong. Okay. Um, but for the distance, I would not expect that. To be honest, we tried this in simulation, mm -hmm. and. Even let's say if you do a let's say a larger Z spread, what you see that one part of the pore is always very nicely aligned, and then the other part becomes very blurred out. But still, the distance that works fine. Okay. So, do you think like uh, uh, individually, like the pores can be? Let's say we have a field of view, and some pores uh, are tilted like upwards, downwards, or how common it is, like you found in your analysis, that you know a fraction of pores are tilted up the plane, some are down, instead of ah. the plane being tilted. Oh, so that yeah, the, so that you mean like this? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the, uh, because yeah, so typically, the, of course, the let's say nuclear envelope is never like perfectly flat on the on on the cover slip. Wasn't that the point actually, like the original, the, the NPC reference paper from Jonas Ries and also in the MinFlux? So initially, a, a lot of uh, analysis was based because the pores are supposed to be very flat, right? That's what they code in the paper. Yeah, so, <laughs> so I, yeah. We, we do a 3D analysis. So mm -hmm. that means, I mean, we would always move them and then only average them after they, in the 3D, they are lying there. So we will never average. And I would say in the, in the 2021 paper, where we had compared three different uh, methods, I would say there's also a tens of degrees of tilt you, you could have. Uh, so that, that's what you encounter. Of course, that most are, let's say this, but they are, they, they are quite tilted a bit. So in the alignment procedure, you have to take this into account. Um, so how, how, what, what was the population? Let's say some were tilted one side. So was the like oh. tilt very random or it was like a very pattern tilt that you might expect even from due to microscope hardware or something? No, 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 no. So I would, I would have to look back at the numbers, but I think it looks like a typical normal distribution. Most are a bit like this. And then you have a few that are a bit more like this. But I would have to, because we measured this, we I probably have the histogram somewhere, but um, the, we mostly included this or measured this because in the simulations, you want to be insensitive that you maybe you simulate all like this. Mm. Um, I think in one of the papers from Jonas Ries, they measured also, let's say, the pores on that side, huh? when the nuclear envelope goes up a bit, and they measured it on the side, the distance, and then this should be a much more reliable, that, and because you only make, yeah. and, then, and then you have a, only the, the, the error in X and Y, it should be a lot smaller. Mm. Um, but of course, then you have to go a bit deeper into the sample. Yeah, so this distance thing is not a, let's say from the averaging part, that's easy, but from the acquisition part, that may be a bit tricky. Um, 
but I do not know, do not remember what percentage would be, let's say, really tilted a lot. Okay. Um, I think now, is, since we've got to about uh, two o'clock, we traditionally wrap up our presentation. So I'd just like everybody to um, join me in thanking Bernd for his very interesting talk. You'll be able to find this on uh, YouTube as well. If you want to on this YouTube channel, if you want to see that again. Um, and with that, I would just like to. I'll give you a clap. Thank you, Lord Bernd. Excellent. Yeah. I'll get some thumbs up here. So thank you very much, Bernd. And um, yeah. see you next week. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Mm.